Hey, Dad. I'm. Oh, is that, yeah. Uh, I'm Pastor James Price in Ottawa, Iowa. I, just, I, I guess I have more just a, a comment and a, and a thank you because, uh, uh, I mean, I've, in my short ministry and in vicarage and stuff like that, I've had a lot of experience, you know, at old ladies' bedsides and hospitals and such. And I've had a lot of experience with my children at a very young age. And of course, I, I remember growing up too in, in your household. And that's the first thing that you teach a child. And it's what you say to someone in incredible pain or who's about to die. Uh, it's what you say when you meet someone at a mechanic shop. Uh, and this is just what we talk, we start with. It, it's the, it really is the foundation of our faith. And it leads to all these other things. And it's so easy to forget. And I, I guess I just have one, uh, I was visiting a lady, this is back in Vicarage. I was, she was 97 years old. And she was in ridiculous amount of pain that I hope I'll never be in. And uh, had tears in her eyes. And I didn't know what to say. I was like 23 years old. And I just said, well, Jesus died for you. And uh, your sins are forgiven. And uh, you're going to go to heaven. And she just said, thank you. I need to hear that. So it's, uh, I don't know, I just want to just thank you. And just be encouraging everyone that this isn't a waste of time. This is the best message that we could possibly focus on. We're not beating the dead horse. Uh, this is really the best thing ever. Thank you for thank you for your comments. There's something that I think uh, young folks don't realize. I'm not old yet, <laughs> but I'm I can see it coming. And uh, I've been giving communion to old people. I mean, really old people <laughs> for over 40 years now. Why do you think they want the Lord's Supper? Because they want the forgiveness of sins. And why do they want the forgiveness of sins? Because they're sinners. Old, sweet, old people. Yeah, that's why we live on that from the time we're born until the time we die. Yes, Reverend Father. <clears throat> uh, soon it'll be Dr. Because, uh, not because I have a PhD, but because Becky's gonna have a baby in September. And when you have 10 kids, according to that Haitian guy that grandpa talked to, you're a doctor, so. Well, I wish I, I, I'd like to, can I be doctor then? You're, all, you're already, you're past that. I think you, have, you got a second <laughs> PhD when Samuel and Peter were born, or something like that. Yeah, yeah when Mary. Uh, thank you very much. I, it was a very uh, moving presentation. And uh, one thing, when, when you went after the uh, people blaming things on individualism and, uh, and, that, and that actually it wasn't individualism that is the problem, but people's pride, and their pride was actually them believing what other people, another corporate you know, body believes. I thought that was just remarkably true. And I thought, you know, how do you, uh, I just had a question of how, how can that, as we go after that, um, or as we, as we, because this is the, this is what everybody. I mean, I've joined in on this many times. Is we live in an individualistic society, because you see uh, the the institutions crumbling, like the family and um, just all these organizations that we've relied upon, um, and and you're saying that it is really a, it is it is a lack of. Uh, teaching the doctrine of justification purely that does this. Um, and uh, so how do we apply this uh, in our, like to families and other, um, and other uh, institutions that we see failing around us? Um, if you have any further words well, on that. On this matter of individualism, I'll tell you the story about Paul Wilkin, who was a member of ours at uh, First Lutheran Church in East Grand Forks. And, uh, oh, Paul was maybe five years older than I. Comes out of church one Sunday. Well, you didn't say much about grace. And uh, I said, I didn't use the word, but I said a lot about grace. And then uh, after I got de disro disrobed, unrobed, whatever, we got talking. And, and the thing with Paul is that nine laymen out of ten would never have had the guts to say that to me. But Paul did. And what was he doing? 
he was showing me respect that I can take some criticism and that he and I can talk. I mean, my job is to give Paul God's word, right? And if I'm not making it so clear, then Paul is my boss. Not that he's going to push me around, but that I'm serving him. And you laymen are responsible. You are individual. Don't just follow along whatever the style happens to be. I've been watching and listening to theology for a long time, and it is like junior high school girls' hairstyles. I mean, it's just everywhere, and you can't deviate. I mean, seriously, you can't. They come up with new expressions all the time. And, and pastors are just as bad as, as anybody. They just follow, follow, follow. Well, I guess I'm kind of getting off here. But the point is this, is we as individuals are responsible and, and, and we need to, uh, I, I've heard this corporate versus individual dichotomy for many years now, and I'm thinking, wait a second, we Lutherans stand as individual Christians, and the church can't believe for you. Um, so I think that, I think that, that, that you, I'm, I'm talking to you lay people especially, is be candid and frank with your pastor. He says something that you don't get, or you think maybe he's off. Guess what? Maybe he made a mistake. It can happen. Yeah. I really appreciated your presentation. Uh, I love the article of justification and its core uh, location in our doctrine. I, uh, in fact, I harp on it so much, like, like a yipping dog, that I've been accused by some older pastors of, you know, all you talk about is justification. Um, but un unbeknownst to them, uh, I also teach some other articles of faith. But I wonder if, if part of our dilemma in terms of confessing and teaching our laity to confess is not that we neglect the second and third section of the small catechism uh, to, to be able to unfold for them how the article of justification also then flows into a life of daily prayer and our vocation, Christian vocations. And if that's not a positive corrective uh, for some of the nonsense that you uh, exposed early on in your paper. I appreciate your comment. I agree. Uh, I just finished a series of sermons, uh, eight sermons on the Lord's Prayer on, at Wednesday evening up in uh, Sydney. And uh, uh, the first three petitions, God coming down here to rescue us, and then the middle one, life in this world, and then the next three petitions, God bringing us from this world to himself in heaven. The whole Lord's Prayer is incomprehensible apart from the doctrine of justification. And, and, and I really think, I, I, I totally agree with you. What, what I'd like to do when I retire is to write a book on how every single topic of the faith, we always say this, but how every topic relates to justification and, and see that this is the kind of like the hub of the wheel. Yeah. Craig Niemeyer, uh, pastor at Zion Lutheran Church, Worms, north of Grand Island. Thank you, Pastor Preuss, for your presentation. Uh, clear articulation once again of uh, the words of our Lord, uh, pure doctrine and in service to justification in the gospel. Happy birthday, too, by the way. Uh, I, in 20 years, a little over 20 years of ministry, um, I have noticed um, our monthly pastors gatherings, the winkling, transitioning from an hour worth of exegetical study followed by systematic study followed by some good meat to um, we spend a lot more, and some great, uh, I respect the brothers where I'm at and great individuals, but it seems like we spend much more time with coffee and donuts, and uh, we've had a few bumps along the way where the words of our Lord uh, introduced some challenging conversations for us. And it, my perception is that it seems sometimes easy, or now, <laughs> 
Uh, we're not doing some of those meaty studies. Um, I'm curious, just your reflections, observations, uh, and it, it comes about from um, the, maybe how you introduced the paper, the experience in our time together. Uh, is, put a question on the table. Um, to, do you notice similar trends going on? Is that a, is that a isolated thing? Uh, is there still need in the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod today for circuits where we gather together and do good meaty study? Well, thank you for your question. Uh, uh, just to share a personal experience, in 2006, I was expelled from the Evangelical Lutheran Synod and then I was uh, reinstated in the Missouri Synod in 2014, accepting a call at the very outset of 2015. So I went a period of nine years without a synod. And during that time, I was a welcome guest at the ELS circuit, because while I got kicked out of their synod, the circuit were all my friends, and at the Missouri Synod. And I get to go to Grand Forks for the Missouri Synod. They were nice guys. I very much appreciate their friendship. But I have to tell you, the ELS guys, we had real exegetical studies. We had guys that did their homework. You didn't just come and shoot the breeze. You worked and prepared something of value for the other men to, to discuss. And uh, it was very beneficial to me. And you know what? When you're outside a synod, you get to meet these people who have no synod at all, and they go weird because they don't have brothers there to, you know, every one of us has the potential to go a little weird, you know, and then, I mean, theologically, okay? But you got your brothers there to hear you and say, wait a second, and then they, you know, it's kind of the mutual conversation consolation, but it's a little bit more than that. So I think that it, I would do my best to get your circuit to, to if you're the visitor, uh, just say, okay, we want to volunteer to do this, and we want a little bit of work done on this. We want to, if we're going to drive this distance and spend this time, let's have a good theological conversation as brothers. For us, yeah, we drive hundreds of miles to get to a winkle. <laughs> so, yes, Pastor, happy birthday again. Well, happy birthday to you. Thanks for sharing your birthday. You're bringing your wife and family and all that here, too. I know you could have uh, spent it other places. Uh, first, that, that reference to that 35-minute wedding sermon. Yeah. Pastor Deloach told me that was the best four sermons he'd ever heard. <laughs> And the reason it took me so long to preach is it takes me 35 minutes to say what you say in 12 or 15. So, and I mean that with 100% sincerity. Thanks for bringing up Don Abden. Um, this Don Abden stuff has permeated and infected so many of our congregations. Our seminaries don't know anything about it or they won't talk about it. It's, uh, it's old stuff. And we have so many young pastors that are coming into congregations where their entire church structure and format is set up according to this Don Abden stuff. You got the books, you got the videos, you got the three ring binders. We've got them all at Good Shepherd Lincoln if you want to see them. And uh, to prepare people for this, I think that would be a great Winkle topic, quite frankly. And it certainly should be uh, something done at the seminaries. My question, you, uh, you mentioned on the bottom of page nine of your paper. What does this mean? It means that you are responsible for the care of your own soul. And then you continue on. You may not submit to a heterodox pastor. You may not adopt a heterodox confession. You may not entrust your soul to anyone but to him who has purchased you, body and soul, with his own blood. I agree with you a thousand percent. What am I to do as a pastor who believes this when I get a transfer request from one of my members to a quote unquote sister congregation in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod that I know is heterodox. 
that is not preaching God's word in its truth and purity, that has all kinds of aberrant practices, including revivalistic worship, and how can I in good conscience turn a blind eye and say, oh yeah, we're, we're uh, all in the big tent. When you love doctrine and care for people's soul, how can you in good conscience do this? And I know Montana is a different beast than Nebraska, but I'm sure you have at least some of this that you've experienced uh, either recently or in the past. What encouragement can you give to the pastors here and the lay leaders when we know this is the reality in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod? Well, that, that is a tough, that's a tough issue. And I think you just maybe distinguish between what, uh, what you can do and what you'd like to see happen. And you're limited as to what you actually can do. But I would call the person who requested the transfer and say, uh, can, we, can we talk about this? And just be very candid about your uh, criticisms of that church and pastor and give specifics and show, I know how you talk, so you just lay it before them in a straightforward, honest way. And then they do what they do and there's not a whole lot we can do about it. But I do think uh, just because we belong to the same synod doesn't mean that we have to muzzle ourselves when it comes to identifying bad practice and bad theology. We, we should do it in a, in a very honest, straightforward way. Pastor Price, thank you for the, the presentation. Always very clarifying as usual. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate having slogans uh, challenged once in a while because we don't think very much when we use slogans too much. They become just taglines that we don't actually process. And so one of the, the slogans that you challenged was this idea that God loves the sinner but hates the sin. And um, I was processing that because it, it made me think, and I, I like that. And, um, and then I was thinking, well, maybe it's best then to say that God hates sinners and, and sin, but he loves his son, and his son's blood covers sinners, and therefore he loves the sinners. And then I thought that, you know, that made sense. But then I was thinking, well, how does that balance with just John 3.16, that it seems as though the cause of God sending his son is that he, he loved the world. And so I'm not sure, I, I'm not making much sense of that in my head. So can you clarify that a little bit for me? Well, that, this is really a great, a great question because the two things go together. You say, did God send, is, is God, did he send his son into the world because he is gracious toward us sinners? Or is he gracious toward us sinners because of what his son did? And the answer is yes. And we, we don't pit them against each other, you know. So, so Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And so you have the love of God. The, the point that I wanted to make in making this point, and I thought it would probably get people's attention, is that when you start talking about God loves you, and that love does not include justification, then you got some bogus kind of a sentimental love. And so uh, it isn't just when you say, well, he loves the sinner but hates the sin, as if the sinner and the sin somehow aren't related to each other. Uh, this, is not, this is not right. I mean, you're going to preach the law is wrath <laughs> and the gospel is forgiveness. But in answer specifically to your question, I would say that... Uh, it is both, uh, if this is what you were asking, it is, it is, grace is what caused his incarnation, and grace is the, also the result of his passion. And in either case, it's the same thing. Uh, we, we shouldn't consider, you can't see God except in Christ, you can't see Christ except in his suffering. So as Jesus is suffering and dying, for us, that's where we see God. And what's happening there, that's the love of God. And that is the forgiveness of sins. And that is the sacrifice and the eternal love all rolled up into one. 
which is why God wants us to eat and drink the body and the blood of Jesus so that justification can be at the very center of our, of our faith. Pastor Preuss, thank you for your uh, presentation to us. And I ask this question with a little bit of trepidation. <laughs> I believe you lumped me in with a silly uh, a little while ago. Uh, but it concerns that love of Christ, uh, excuse me, faith of Christ instead of faith in Christ. Um, and I remember when I was at seminary, we had this discussion about the preposition ek, I think it is, um, whether it could be translated in or of. And there was a professor who maintained that it should be translated of uh, more than it is in. And I have used that phrase, and matter of fact, I used it yesterday in my sermon, uh, that uh, we are saved by the faith of Christ. Um, and so I, I wish, I know you said that um, it's in vogue and it's silly and you hate to even bring it up, but you were going to anyway, but I would appreciate it if you would indulge me. And uh, uh, if I've got an error there, help correct my error, please. Well, I was, uh, I'll make a confession. This is probably all being recorded. Has anybody ever heard of the American Lutheran Publicity Bureau? Okay, these are basically high church libs from the East Coast. And I go on there. And there's one ELCA fella, a couple of years older than I am. And he uses that argument basically to minimize, if not eliminate, the, the need for personal faith. But if in a particular Bible passage... Uh, uh, pistis is translated faithfulness rather than faith and is a description of Jesus' faithfulness rather than our personal faith. I would say uh, I'm open to correction. I'm not a Greek scholar, and maybe so. But what this fella argued, and I think this is often the case, is they talk about the faithfulness of Christ as a way of uh, replacing the necessity of personal individual faith. I mean, clearly, if you're talking about the faithfulness of Christ or the faith of the Christian, you're talking about two different things, but they're tightly joined. So that, that was what I was, was, was referring to. Uh, he's some Norwegian fella uh, from the ELCA uh, who posts frequently on the ALPB forum letter, and that was specifically the kind of thing I had in mind, and not to criticize my orthodox brothers who say, well, in this particular case, it could mean that. Uh, I'd have to get out the Greek Testament and look at it with you. So, Marcus McKay, Zionsville, Indiana. Um, I stepped out, so I don't know if this question was asked already. Uh, your statement towards the end of your paper about one's personal responsibility, I think was the word used for mm -hmm. their faith. Does that sound right? Personal responsibility for their faith. No. For the care of their soul. Oh, care of their soul. Thank you. So um, could you clarify that in terms of sale sorga um, and what scripture says about the pastors having accountability then for the soul? I, I assume you're going after a both and. I don't know. I think you're right. I would say that... Uh I would say that the personal responsibility of the pastor to care for the flock does not mean that each individual member of the flock is not responsible to judge the teaching of the preacher. Uh, John Gerhardt, CFW Walther, and other Lutherans uh, go to the text uh, the gospel lesson for the eighth Sunday after Trinity, where Jesus says, beware of false prophets. And he's talking to the people, not to the ministers, but to the people. And uh, to beware of false prophets gives the laity the authority and the duty to judge, not just corporately as a congregation to make sure they don't get a bad pastor or to remove a false teacher, but also individually, for every individual Christian, his duty is to judge the teaching of his preacher. 
but it's certainly not to say that the pastor doesn't have that corresponding responsibility to care for the soul of his parishioners. Amen. Thank you. By the way, I, I'd like to make a confession here. I, 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 after I finished this paper, I thought I didn't talk enough about mission because I thought everybody else is talking about mission. And then I heard Pastor Poppy's paper yesterday. I thought, well, what difference does it make? Because he basically pre he gave my paper yesterday. And so uh, it, it's, just, it's just nice how these things work out. And the fact that I neglected the actual topic given to me what difference does it make? He covered it himself, so thank you for that. Are we out of time then? Okay, thanks a lot.